It's the old mind-body problem. They can't see any other way to solve the mind-body problem. They think intentionality can't function causally by itself, and it can only function if it's physically implemented. And, it, and this is where they get excited, and they say in the entire history of science, there's only been one answer to how mental states could function causally, how semantics could be causal, and that is it's implemented in a computer, in a, in a computer hardware. And you take issue with that. Yeah, idea. right. That is, mm -hmm. I think, that uh, there isn't a problem about how semantics can function causally because we all experience it every day. I mean, for example, by semantics, we just mean mental contents, yeah. okay? Right now, I happen to be very thirsty typical of people on television. They get thirsty. Mm. Now, later on, I'm going to go and drink some water. My state of thirst is going to cause me to drink water. That's a case of a semantic content causing behavior. There's nothing mysterious about that. I mean, I want to drive to Berkeley, and I believe the best way is to go over the Richmond Bridge. That combination is going to cause some behavior on my part. Mm -hmm. So the problem that it was designed to solve, namely, how can mental content and semantics function causally to move my body around, that was never a problem mm -hmm. in the first place. Well, I think uh, as a philosopher, one of the, the interesting things I find in your work is your willingness to deal with this kind of naive view of causality and, and to stand up for it, to suggest that we, this is our basic experience, this is what we have, nobody's going to be convinced otherwise, even though it seems to go against the whole grain of modern science. Well, actually, the, the whole grain of modern science is, is uh, not so much opposed to this as you might think. It's the ideology which has been inherited from a 17th and 18th century attack on a certain conception of causation and the attack was led by David Hume and he said there isn't any experience of causation all there are are statements of regularities all we can find are regularities in the universe yeah. and all we mean by causation are these regularities now of course nowadays we think the regularities are the scientific laws but the real mistake was to suppose that there's no experience of causation. And it seems to me it's something we experience every day. Just watch. And my arm went up. Now, why did it go up? Well, I decided to raise it. A mental event, my decision, actually caused a physical event. Somebody thinks that can't happen or I can't experience that? Mm -hmm. You just watch me. So there was a basic mistake in Hume. He was looking at the wrong place. He wanted to look out at events in the world and find a, an experience of a connection between the events. Whereas what I'm suggesting is the actual experience of causation is in our ordinary perception and action. And that is an experience of acting uh, that's intentional causation moving our bodies, or if you like, in perception, our bodies are affected by mm -hmm. the outside world. Once again, we experience the world mm -hmm. causally impacting on our bodies. Well, wouldn't you suggest though, that the world of physics uh, suggests that the whole universe is made up of nothing but particles, and, and these particles move back and forth and collide into each other, and I think you even go so far as to say that in spite of quantum indeterminacy, that uh, from this point of view, events in the macro world are all determined by the movement of these particles. So it's rather bold, I should think, to suggest that a mental event can have a causal influence. Right. Okay. No, now, you pose the, uh, the problem exactly, and let me just give a brief answer to it, and that's this. Is the world made of... Uh, of of minute physical particles. Well, particles have been misleading. They're points of mass energy. But anyway, mm -hmm. it's made, we'll use a technical term, itsy bitsy bits of stuff. Okay, there's right. a lot of little uh, entities w which are the ultimate composition of reality. But now here's the marvelous thing from this point of view, and that is this combination, these systems of entities, have higher level physical features. They have uh, uh, such things as a, a, a mass. Uh, and velocity of larger systems than just the individual particles of which the systems are composed. Right. And among those systems are biological systems, some of which are alive, and among those that are alive, some of them have nervous systems, and some of those nervous systems are able to sustain consciousness. Now, on this picture, consciousness is just an ordinary, higher-level physical property of nervous systems. It's no more mysterious than that my brain should be conscious than that a bunch of H2O molecules should be in a liquid form. Of course, you can't say of any molecule 
this one's wet or this one's liquid, mm -hmm. but the whole system is liquid. In exactly the same way, you can't say of any neuron, this one's conscious, but the whole system is conscious. So what I'm trying to get across is this. You're absolutely right. The world is entirely made up of and accountable for in terms of physical particles. And there are higher, but at the same time, there are higher level features of these physical particles, such as solidity, liquidity, and consciousness, and they function causally. The higher level features have a separate causal level of reality. Mm -hmm. So that if you're pounding a, a, a nail w with a hammer, the solidity and the weight of the hammerhead function causally, and the real causation there, even though, of course, the hammerhead has properties that are entirely explicable in mm -hmm. terms of the molecular structure. Similarly with consciousness, my conscious desire to raise my arm can cause my arm to go up, even though, of course, the whole thing has a level of description where it consists of acetylcholine, a neurotransmitter, um, being uh, uh, transmitted across a synaptic cleft. So from your point of view, the mind-body problem has essentially been solved. They're one and the same. It, That's right. Just like th whatever perspective you're looking at the phenomenon from. From yeah. one perspective it looks mental, from another perspective it looks physical, like the wave-particle duality. You're well, it isn't even a duality. Mm -hmm. I just want to, I want to say the big mistake, and, and Descartes got a lot to answer for because he more than anybody else in the 17th century is responsible for this mistake, but it's been with us for 300 years. The big mistake is to suppose if it's mental, it can't be physical. If it's physical, it can't be mental. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to say is, look, we just live in one world. And let's call that world physical. It's a good enough word. And among the properties in that world are some that are mental. But they're not mental as opposed to physical. They're physical because they're mental. Consciousness is just a higher level physical state of the brain, just like weight and uh, liquidity and solidity. So you're not saying that it's an epiphenomenon? No, now. absolutely not. Mm -hmm. I mean, any more than the solidity of the hammer is an epiphenomenon. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people think, oh, well, if it's, if it's just a feature of the brain, then the work, real work is being done down there at the level of the uh, neurons and the synapses. But nobody would say that about the hammer or the piston. Mm -hmm.